Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and as I often do, sometimes on Saturday I get my son to look at artwork with me and help me pick out something that I can invest in. But today his attitude was so bad that I had to get my wife's help and here she is. This is on I think this is my wife's debut on this channel. I don't think you've ever heard her voice. This is on Masterworks and I'm thinking about buying one of these and so I wanted you to look at these and see if you, any of them jumped out at you. Your son said that that one looks like the devil. So is that, that one, the one? That one's interesting. I think. Go. Can you go back up? I don't. Know. I kind of like the green in it. Um, I like green. green favorite colors. I think that one's kind of calming. All right. I like that one. Okay, that's the one we'll buy. All right, that was simple enough. This is the one that she chose, Joan Mitchell. Um, that one right there. And so on Masterworks, just to remind everybody. They, they're securitizing these artworks. So they go out, they go out and buy a piece of artwork, then they cr turn it into $20 shares, and then you can buy a minimum investment of $500. It's the coolest thing ever. All right, that'll be in the top of the description of this video if it's something you wanna go check out. Now, I felt like I'm, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills in the crypto space because the SEC has to protect investors from XRP, but ApeCoin is completely safe, folks. So far, we have Shiba Inu, we have DogCoin, we have ApeCoin. Those are all safe, according to Gary Gensler. But XRP is this dangerous thing that's going to just destroy you investors out there. This is how you know it's a lie, folks. This is all one big fat lie, is that that absurdity right there alone is really all you need to see to know that, that we are living through lying times folks these people don't have an honest bone in their body now uh leonidas found an interesting video this is from that that um when brad garlinghouse was at that coin agenda conference in the bahamas i believe he uh apparently they interviewed him behind the scenes listen to this at this is ripple's really trying to solve that cross-border payments problem you know uh central bank digital currencies are you know, domestic by that by nature they're issued by a central bank uh, or potentially issued by a central bank so they're not really solving cross-border problems they're solving domestic uh solutions more often than not so look i, I think that the what we're seeing happen with stable coins we're seeing happening with central bank issued digital assets i think is exciting I'm not exactly clear how it's all going to play out. You're seeing countries experiment and test. Uh, Ripple has partnered with several uh, central banks around the world. Some we've announced, some we haven't yet announced. That's the news right there. There are central banks that Ripple has partnered with that they have not announced yet. That's big. That they're issuing uh, and testing using the XRP ledger to issue their digital assets on the XRP ledger as a as a token. So uh, we're excited to be working with them. And look, at our core, Ripple's really good at working with enterprise customers. A government is just a big enterprise customer. You know, we know how to sell to. That's an interesting notion. <laughs> it, it, I mean, in some ways, it's just a really big enterprise customer. And, mm -hmm. We're pretty good at that now because we've had a lot of experience with it and worked with some of the largest banks in the world, uh, as well as a lot of the smaller payment companies that have grown very quickly using our technology. It's helped them grow more quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, All right, and Leonidas found one more interesting clip here. Uh, I, you know, I, I keep that to myself mostly. I mean, I, I am involved in kind of index uh, of you know, various other leading cryptos, but I, I don't do it even in the stock market you know I've, i don't do a lot of individual stock picks uh, for the same reason but, yeah. uh, so do you still invest into stocks or are you all into crypto uh i would say about 90 percent of my personal net worth is in crypto and let me tell you what yes, it's cool. yeah. Yeah. you know brad garlinghouse is no dummy and he knows that he knows that you when you're wealthy you diversify your investments and so what it tells me when i hear that that um, he's 90% in crypto, I, that tells me that he knows that this thing is going to take the freak off because 
He doesn't want to. It's not time to diversify until you get through that blast off period. I mean, that's the way I'm looking at it for myself is, yeah, I'm high percentage in crypto and in private equity around crypto um, of what I have. But I'm but I'm only there for because I believe we're we're entering that small window. And I think it's going to be a maybe a one to three, one to two to three year window get out from under the lawsuit, the SEC lawsuit, the Ripple can go public, all of the different, that's why I keep talking about Link2 and, and, and the private equity, not just Ripple, but Link2 private equity and some of the others, that that's the reason that those are so important is because so many things can happen once this Ripple lawsuit's over. And so anyway, I think that's the reason he's 90% around crypto. Now, uh, before I show you this, Anders L did a really good thread on Ripple changing their website. And I said, never forget, for years, the paid for proof of work liars, is what I call them, tried to scare us out of XRP. Ripple, the company, is great, they said. Ripple doesn't need XRP, they said. The banks will never use XRP, they said. A bunch of liars for hire, and they never thought we'd put it all together. And it's so true, folks. That, that was what they always said. Oh yeah, we think Ripple, the company's great, but I just don't understand XRP. And they were lying through their teeth and they know it. They didn't think that anybody would look much further past that. Now look at this, Anders L. Ripple just redesigned their website and I'd like to focus on the largest difference. There's now a, more of a full focus on crypto. This is the first thing you see on the homepage, okay? Powered by crypto. Um, First text, uh, first text you see when you scroll down um, is crypto solutions built for business. And then it goes down the different uh, use cases highlighted, cross-border, crypto liquidity, CBDC. If you click on the cross-border payments, you are shown this. Notice that their solution in, includes XRP without any solutions shown about XRP, which is, which is very interesting indeed. The benefits of Ripple's cross-border payment solution is shown. Notice the free up working capital is the first benefit highlighted, and this is the benefit XRP ODL offers. Real-time settlement is also brought by XRP. The first thing shown about Ripple's cross-border payment solution, full focus on instant settlement part, which should mean XRP ODL. Next use case shown is Ripple's liquidity hub, shown as a full solution to buy, sell, and hold digital assets. This is how it works, and it shows Ripple's liquidity hub right there. Last use case is CBDC. Interestingly, they write that it's a private side chain of the XRP ledger. This will mean that settlement between different CBDCs through XRP will, will be as seamless as possible. But of course, the more CBDCs built on Ripple's solution, the easier. Um, and here it says, private side chains of XRP ledger. To conclude, it seems there is now full focus on crypto for Ripple. We know that their plan was always to build the rails for XRP and other cryptos first. Remember the flywheel from 2020? I believe we're at six now. Look at this. Yeah, I remember the flywheel. Boosting with digital assets. Proving value, proving feasibility, moving to production, uh, building trust and demand, expediting move to go live, boosting with digital assets. And by the way, folks, because I was sitting at the presentation when they did the presentation of the Ripple software in, in Singapore at, at Ripple Swell, when they, when they did a demo of the software, well, I didn't pull it up here, but I saw a picture, a screenshot on the new website of that software being used. So yeah, I think Anders L is right. Now, um, because I told you this, I will be sleeping with this Freedom of Information Act list and all of the people's names on it will be, that will be my waking mission as I drink my coffee, which I do have beside me, I will be going through this list and looking for video, their own words, because all of these people will be called out constantly until we get a level playing field because they deserve everything they get 
Uh, and I'm not saying that all of them involved in the Ethereum free pass that were in those meetings were bad people. Some of them, I don't, I don't think that some of them realized that they were going to come out of those meetings and all that would have happened is Bitcoin and Ethereum would have gotten a free pass. I believe some of them, like Nancy Wotos, were in those meetings working in good faith. There are others, however, that I do not think were working in good faith. All right. So, um, I said this, ETH disguised whales, Ethereum free pass, secret meetings with the SEC, FUD against Ripple, the lies, the SEC suit. It's always been about where the money and power will flow from the digitization of the world. But don't take my word for it. Here's Chris Dixon of Andres and Horowitz. Listen to this. I put a little clip together. Remember, Chris Dixon is the guy that Jay Clayton went over to Andres and Horowitz and he said, Chris, you put together a working group of all these industry players and then that's what eventually became the Ethereum Free Pass, folks. Listen. You said, what am I most excited about Web3? Yeah. Yeah, look, I think, you know, I think it's, uh, I mean, I think that the stakes are very high. I mean, it's the, you know, the internet, I think that this, the internet's still in a very early phase and um, the questions that, you know, the, the, the questions that, that we're discussing are how will that, how will this incredibly important invention be architected over the next, you know, whatever decades, hundred years, where will the money and power flow, you know, who will control that? Um, so it's, it seems to me, you know, just being, I think the, to me, it's an incredible opportunity that I can be part of that and that we all can be part of that and that we can have this kind of impact. I didn't frankly expect to have this kind of size opportunity in my career, you know, I, I lived through the first wave of the internet and I feel fortunate to be now in this sort of third wave. Um, and I think it's, what's, what, to me, what's so important is it's a really fascinating technology and products and all the other kind of good stuff, but there's also a mission, right? Um, I'm sure Jay took it to heart. So Jay, Jay went on the war path to these, um, uh, these, uh, these, these scathing speeches and calling out the industry and everybody. So, but he, he, he then, after talking to Grunfest in a fireside chat at the Stanford um, uh, campus, uh, made his way over to see Andreessen the next morning. And this is the part that now not a lot of people know. Um, and he invited um, Chris Dixon to round up the sort of the, the industry um, players who were really kind of trying to do it the right way um, and asked for a couple of things. One, essentially, you know, lay out in a very detailed written for, for, you know, footnoted memo um, what existing law says about utility tokens. Um, and two, give us a proposal for where to go from here. Um, and so, uh, uh, Andreessen, I've been representing Andreessen and all of their crypto um, investments since the, since the beginning. And so um, so I got the chance to be the one to, to write all that stuff. So, uh, and I pulled in uh, Cooley and I pulled in a couple of other law firms. So we've, we've now got a nice little working group of uh, law firms that are in the space that are doing this. Uh, How will this incredibly important invention be architected over the next, you know, whatever decades, hundred years, where will the money and power flow? You know, who will control that? All right, so he's worried about who's going to control that. Um, and then I did this. This is Nick Grossman, who is also on the Freedom of Information Act list. He would be right here. He's with Union Square Ventures, and I, he hasn't gotten enough attention, so I wanted to give him some attention here. Um, the, I, I call this the Ethereum decentralization lie. Um, and I'm translating what he says in this clip you're about to listen to. If you get to the S, if you if you get to the SEC and can work it out in secret with Bill Hinman that you will be called decentralized, then you are. That's my translation of what he says here. I think what's interesting about it is making the leap from something started by a, a small group of people to you know becoming something more like an open source phenomenon. And not very many projects have done it. I, I you I would say for sure, obviously Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum is, you know, has crossed and, and a lot of this has to do with sort of the regulatory lens and, you know, is there a single promoter behind a project and that has uh, weight on whether something is a security or not, but it also shapes, you know, what is it like to invest in something. So oftentimes at the beginning, uh, we're investing in things that either are startup companies or look like them. Um, 
but over time, I think the way that you invest in the space begins to look very different because projects launch. Um, once once projects launch, you know, if if anything's going well, people start to build around them. Uh, if there's an open sort of governance process, you know, other people start to other groups and people start to have you know input and control and and so you know the what it means to be an investor in this space is. Um, very different than a traditional, you know, VC startup investing. And this is all such BS. This would be like if Microsoft uh, started and they said, "Okay, we're gonna now we're gonna put we're gonna hire software engineers and we're gonna spread them out across the world. We're gonna put some in Switzerland. We're gonna put some over in, in London, and we'll have some in New York and some in Seattle. And so now we're decentralized. That's basically what these clowns are saying here. That's what they're trying to sell to the world. Meanwhile, what they're not telling you is who those disguised whales that bought early in the ICO because those are the people that really control this thing. They can call it decentralized all they want, but the digital asset investor is not buying this crock of BS because I know BS when I see it. I've been around, you know, that's my son of a woman quote from Al Pacino. Uh, Tom Emmer um, had tweeted this out, I think, yesterday, and John Deaton um, replied to him. He said, I'm so looking forward to hearings after midterm election. I think John Deaton's letting Tom Emmer know, look, guys, you guys might be able to get away with this excuse right now. Oh, we don't, we don't have the majority and all that. Warren Davidson says that all the time. Well, guess what, Warren? If you're listening out there, once that excuse is gone, and I think it is going to be gone based on everything I've seen about how these elections are going to go, once it is gone, we're going to remind you. So get ready. Hope you're, hope you're not too in thick with all these Ethereum people. Um, James Philan uh, put this out, I think, uh, yesterday. The SEC has filed a letter motion asserting the attorney-client privilege, privilege in connection with the Hinman speech. These people are pulling out all the stops. They, ca they, they cannot let us ever see any of this stuff, folks. Um, John Deaton said, pay attention to this language. The SEC seeks leave to redact two comments discussing pending determinations before the commission found in entries 29 and 35. John says, what pending determinations must be other digital assets? Any no action letters after this? Then Jeremy Hogan weighed in on it. If, you really, if you're really interested in attorney-client privilege, then by all means read on. But just, just know you are a little messed up in the head. Attorney-client privilege requires three things, and the SEC is going to have a problem with all three in this motion. Um, the first one is attorney-client privilege requires a communication between an attorney and a client. The, uh, when Hinman client uh, of a was Hinman a client of a zillion different lawyers and non-lawyers who apparently gave input in the speech? If the speech was just his personal opinion, was he even a client of those of of all these lawyers? Two, the privilege requires the communication he uh, be made in confidence. There were 68 emails related to this speech. The thing I don't think we know, did all of the emails remain within the SEC? How many non-lawyers were copied? This is also maybe a problem for the SEC. Attorney-client privilege requires the communication have pr uh, provided legal guidance. This is SEC's biggest problem and why its argument in this motion on the prong is fairly circular. The case law that the SEC is relying on is clear that the policy discussions are not legal guidance. All right. And then Brad Garlinghouse weighed in on Susan Friedman's tweet I showed you yesterday. He says the DCEA is back in action. I told you yesterday, I reminded you of one of Brad Garlinghouse's tweets from back in like October 2020, where he brought up the DCEA. And now he's brought it back up. Congress taking a bipartisan leadership stance on regulatory clarity for crypto is exactly what we need. I'm going to finish with this. TAIG caught my attention with this tweet. Hey world, are you wondering why Brandon Chez prefers to remain anonymous? Simple. Brandon Chez doesn't actually exist. Fact. There are quite a few people that don't exist who have filled reports who have filed reports with an agency that swore to protect us. Rules for thee, but not for me. Gary Gensler. Now, I said, please tell me more, TAIG, because I don't know what he's talking about here. How does he know that Brandon Chez doesn't actually exist? 
Folks, do you realize the implications of that if, if he is correct? Because if Brandon Chez was a made-up character, if that's not really a person, then the, the next question is, okay, well, who was behind Coin Market Cap? And then the next question is, okay, well, whoever that was behind uh, Coin Market Cap, what what was their, why were they trying to keep it hidden that they were behind it, and who knew what they were up to? And then the next question is, did Mike Novogratz and Multicoin Capital, who we know that Multicoin Capital, because I tweeted it last night, we know now, Multicoin Capital, Tushar Jain and his partner that were bragging in 2018 about shorting XRP, we now know that they are investors in this company, I think it's called Saffron Finance, which supposedly Brandon Chez is also an investor in. So my immediate question is, did those guys at Multicoin Capital know the guy that started, or the entity or whatever that started uh, Coin Market Cap? Did they know that person or group back when Coin Market Cap in January of 2018 did the uh, chain took out the Korean prices of XRP, tanking the price, and were they short at that time? We know that Mike Novogratz was short at that time because he can't quit running his mouth and he bragged about it. Did he know who was behind Coin Market Cap, whether it's Brandon Chez or somebody else? And if they did, were they aware or in any way involved in what happened when they took out Korean prices? That is where all this leads. If what that's the can of worms that opens up if TAIG is right that this is a fictional character. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family that boy are the buzzards circling now. Just like they did, they did on my deer stand that they, that they decided to nest in. Remember when I told that story? Ooh, it smelled inside of that deer stand. That's why I had to get my father, the official father of the digital asset investor channel, to clean it out because I couldn't do it.